For our discussion of vision, we're going to be covering the structure of the eye internally and externally, the visual pathways that take information from the eye to the brain itself, accessory structures that are associated with the eye, and then also muscles that move the eye. So starting with the structure. The wall of the eye itself consists of three principal layers called tunics. The fibrous tunic is the outermost layer, the vascular tunic is the middle layer, and the innermost layer is the retina, or sometimes also referred to as the neural tunic. We're going to go ahead and start on the outside and then just work our way in. Uh, so the fibrous tunic provides physical support and protection for the eye, and it also serves as an attachment point for the muscles that move the eye. The sclera makes up the majority of the fibrous tunic, and it covers most of the eye's surface. Uh, this is what you would casually refer to as the white of the eye. It consists of uh, dense, irregular connective tissue with collagen and elastic fibers, which is what helps to give the eye its characteristic round shape. The anterior part of the sclera does contain small blood vessels, but not enough to get it any obvious color. Now, continuous with the, clara, the sclera is the cornea. Uh, the cornea is the transparent avascular part of the fibrous tunic at the far anterior end of the eye. Because it's not vascularized, the epithelial cells in this structure rely on surrounding fluids to transport oxygen and nutrients. Corneal abrasions, or scratches, are one of the most common types of eye injuries. Most of the time they heal on their own within a few days, but if an injury or infection is severe enough, the damage can be permanent and can ultimately impair your vision. Fortunately, the cornea is the only part of the eye that can actually be transplanted. A corneal transplant is performed when decreased vision or discomfort from corneal damage can't be corrected just with lenses or medication. And so it actually involves removing a portion of the damaged cornea and then grafting that corneal tissue from the corneal tissue from a deceased donor in its place. So you can see images here from a, a patient who had damage to the cornea that gave it this cloudy like appearance. So that would be kind of almost the equivalent of putting, you know, a frosted piece of glass in front of your eye trying to see through that. And this is showing the cornea that was transplanted from a donor. So all of those little zigzags that you see there, those are all actually the sutures that are stitching on the new cornea to the rest of the sclera um, and, and probably a little bit of the cornea that remained around the outer edge. Now, if you've ever been asked to sign off as being an organ donor, you probably weren't considering part of your eye as an option. But in fact, in 2018 alone, U.S. eye banks provided over 85,000 corneas for transplant. And that includes 28,000 that were exported to other countries after the need in the U.S. had already been met. Um, however, they do actually estimate that there are over 10 million cornea blind patients worldwide. So there's certainly still a very high need for this organ. The vascular tunic consists or contains uh, numerous blood vessels and the intrinsic eye muscles that move the lens and change the shape of the pupil. From anterior to posterior, there is the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. The choroid has an extensive network of capillaries that helps to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the retina. The ciliary body is where you're going to find the muscles that are responsible for changing the shape of the lens, and we're going to return to that in a moment. And then finally, the iris is the colored portion of the eye, which also contains two layers of smooth muscle that adjusts the diameter of the pupil, controlling how much light enters. The muscles of the iris are arranged into two groups, the sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae muscles. The sphincter pupillae muscles are muscle fibers that are arranged in a ring, and when circular muscle fibers contract, the opening in the middle of that ring gets smaller, and this results in pupil constriction. The dilator pupillae muscle fibers are arranged in a radial fashion, like the spokes of a wheel. And when these muscles contract and get shorter, it pulls the perimeter of the pupil outward, and that results then in pupil dilation. Now, obviously, you don't have any conscious control over the size of your pupil, and both sets of muscles are innervated by the autonomic nervous system. So what about changing uh, muscles that change the shape of the lens? As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the muscles of the ciliary body control how the lens focuses an image onto the retina. It contains the ciliary muscle, which is a ring of smooth muscle, and the ciliary processes, which are small folds of epithelium that cover the muscles. The suspensory ligaments connect the ciliary body to the outer capsule of the lens, and when the ligaments are either relaxed or tightened, it's going to cause a change in the shape of the lens. So I want to look at an example to help illustrate this process. So most sagittal section illustrations of the eye that point out the ciliary muscles don't give you a good appreciation for their true shape. 
Um, but as I mentioned, these are circular muscles. And so this is actually what the ciliary muscles look like. It almost to me looks like the um, kind of the edges of a steering wheel in your car. And the lens is at the very center of that steering wheel where you would find the horn if you wanted to press on the horn of your car. And then all of those suspensory ligaments are connecting the outer edge of the steering wheel to the center part of the steering wheel. Now when those muscles are relaxed, that means that the opening in the ring, so and in this case this is kind of the entire opening of the ring, is as, as, is as large as it can be, and that's when those are relaxed. Now because those ligaments don't have any elastic components to them like muscles do, uh, the ligaments can't be stretched like a rubber band. It's almost like instead you're trying to stretch a piece of yarn. It, you know, it gets to its, its you know, longest length and then that's as far as it goes. So when those muscles are really relaxed, it's pulling those ligaments really taut and then that is flattening out the lens. Because while we might like to think about a lens as always being something that's hard, um, your lenses are certainly flexible and that's what allows you to focus. So muscles are relaxed, ligaments are taut, lens is flattened. And when that happens, that allows you to be able to focus on something that is at a distance. The exact opposite is happening when you're focusing on something close up. When you're looking at something close up, the ciliary muscles are going to contract. And when those are contracting, that's going to make the hole smaller because this is again a sphincter muscle. And the, um, because these ligaments, again, it's like taking a piece of yarn that had been stretched all the way, and now you're going to take it and put your two finger, your you know fingers on the two hands closer together, and that little piece of yarn, that little string, that little ligament is going to loosen in this case. And so now it's not going to be pulling on that lens, and so the lens is going to take on a more rounded shape. That is then going to allow you to look at something closer up. So... The closer up you're looking at something, the more those muscles are contracting there around the eye. I want to show you this um, little video here, not because um, of, of, the, of the content that's actually in here, um, which is honestly not all that important, um, but it's a really great illustration of how this process actually occurs. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit here. Um, it's kind of a, a nice little animation that's showing you on the inside here that ciliary body and now you can see how that ring of muscles got um, contracted and so all of these ligaments they're loosened and now in this case relaxed here it's tightening loosening the ligaments the lens is getting bigger now then when those muscles are going to relax now the ligaments are nice and tight and that flattened out the lens contracted muscles loose ligaments round lens Muscles are going to relax here in a little bit, tight ligaments, and then a nice flat lens. I'll go ahead and post a link to this little animation um, in case you want to play. So how does this relate to typical cases of nearsightedness and farsightedness? Normal vision is called emetropia, and this occurs when the lens is able to bend parallel rays of light so that they converge onto the back of the retina. Now, some individuals exhibit hyperopia or farsightedness. And in individuals who are farsighted, parallel rays converge behind the back of the retina because their eyeball is essentially too short. And so the way that we correct this is by giving, having that, those light rays pass through convex corrective lenses um, before it gets to the eye in general, and then that's going to basically correct that focal plane. Myopia is the exact opposite. That's nearsightedness. And this is when these parallel rays converge in front of the retina because your eyeball is basically too long. So we do the exact opposite as well. We get, um, provide them with concave corrective lenses instead of convex, and that pushes back the focal plane so it's actually onto the retina then. Now with age, the lens can become less resilient so that focusing on near objects, especially when the lens would need to become more spherical, um, it becomes more limited. And you might often see people... Um, who are a little, little bit older, kind of holding objects at a distance so that they can see it better because there's less accommodation that's necessary. Um, or you see that they will often get reading glasses. Um, why does that occur? So let's think again about how this process would occur in somebody whose eye was functioning correctly. Again, we're trying to look at something up close here. So uh, those ciliary muscles of ours are going to uh, contract. That is going to relax the suspensory ligaments. That is, un in most conditions, it would allow the lens to take on this rounded shape, which would then allow the correct focusing of an object that is close up. 
However, as we just mentioned, if somebody who has presbyopia, um, in the case of somebody who has presbyopia, even though those suspensory ligaments would relax, the lens is going to stay in that flattened state. It's not going to, as you can see in the normal position here, be able to take on that rounded shape. And so because the lens is staying flat, it's going to project that image behind the retina. And that's why people need to get reading glasses and that'll help bring that focal plane closer up. So hopefully you should have been able to deduce that Everything in terms of the muscles and the ligaments, all of that is happening just as normal. The only thing that's changed is that the shape of the lens won't be changed by those suspensory ligaments. So the retina is the innermost tunic of the eye and it consists of two distinct layers. There's the pigmented layer, which is right up against the choroid. Um, this is attached to that choroid and it absorbs light energy that passes through the retina and then also provides the photoreceptor cells that it's right next to with vitamin A. And then there's the neural layer, which is the thicker part of the retina. And this houses all of the photoreceptors as well as the other associated neurons. So what are all these neurons that we're gonna find there in the neural layer? Um, the outermost ones, again, up against that pigmented layer are the photoreceptor cells. So this is going, and you have two different types of photoreceptors in the human eye, those being rods and cones. Um, rods don't detect different colors of light. They're very light sensitive and they enable us to see in dimly lit rooms. Um, but the cones are the ones that actually detect different colors. Uh, three types of cones and they're each stimulated in human eyes again, and they're stimulated by different wavelengths. Um, you may have heard before of humans having the green and red and blue cones that are associated with those different lights or those different wavelengths of lights. Just um, interior to that is where you're going to find the bipolar cells. Those are the ones that are synapsing with the photoreceptors and then also connecting them to the ganglion cells. And those ganglion cells then are going to be the innermost ones. These are the ones that are um, receiving their impulses from the bipolar cells. And then the axons of all of these ganglion cells are coming together. They are ultimately the ones that are going to leave the retina and form the optic nerve. This is a nice electron uh, micrograph showing the, uh, those layers of the retina. So here's that choroid layer, and then you can see this layer right here that's very, very small, very thin, only a single cell layer thick. That is that pigmented layer of the retina. And then everything else here on down is going to be part of the neural layer. So these are all rods and cones, parts of the rods and cones, but these are the nuclei that are being stained by the staining technique. And so that's why they appear this dark purple. So these are all these little dark dots that you see here are the nuclei of the rods and the cones. And then this is the region where they are synapsing with the bipolar cells. And so here you can see the line that occurs of all of the nuclei of the bipolar cells. Those are then synapsing with the ganglion cells. Here are all of those nuclei. And then everything you see below this, everything right around here are all of the axons of those ganglion cells heading on, um, on their way out of the retina. On the posterior retina, the axons of all of these ganglion cells are going to converge on the optic disc. And you can see that in this illustration right here, as well as in this photograph right here. Um, that the region of the optic disc is where those, all of those axons are going to leave the retina and officially originate the optic nerve or cranial nerve number two. Uh, the axons are gonna essentially turn, as you can see here, they're gonna penetrate the wall of the eye and then proceed towards the diencephalon. This is also where the retinal arteries and veins enter and exit the retina. retina. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because there aren't any photoreceptors in this region, any light that strikes this specific region of the retina goes unnoticed, and therefore that's why this is commonly referred to as your blind spot. Now if we look just lateral to the optic disc, right here where you can see there's a ring drawn on this image, and then you can see right over here at the bottom of this textbook illustration, is a yellow colored disc called the macula lutea, which literally means um, yellow spot. And in the center of that macula is a small little shallow depression called the fovea centralis. Uh, this fovea centralis is almost directly posterior to the pupil. And this is the region of the retina that contains the highest proportion of cones and almost no rods. So this is the area where, um, kind of where your area of sharpest vision, sharpest color vision specifically is. Um, about half of the nerve fibers in the optic nerve 
carry information from this tiny region, even though it's only 1.5 millimeters in diameter. So that kind of gives you an idea of exactly how sensitive it is. So what can go wrong with the retina here? Um, one classic example is what's referred to as diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is actually the leading cause of vision impairment and blindness among working age adults. It affects about 30 to 50% of diabetics between 20 and 74 years old. That's a huge amount there. Uh, it's thought to be caused um, by chronically high blood sugar from diabetes that is then associated with damage to the tiny blood vessels that are in the retina. And it proceeds across um, 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 kind of a spectrum of severity. So in mild cases, you're just typically going to see um, some, for example, right here, um, some small areas of balloon-like swellings in some of the blood vessels that are called microaneurysms. You can see a couple here that are identified on this image. Um, these occur at the very earliest stage of the disease, and so those are often one of the first things that people, that um, uh, doctors are looking for when they're taking these pictures in, in your eye and trying to look at the back of your retina. Um, but as then the disease progresses, the blood vessels that nourish the retina can start to swell and then distort and eventually even lose their ability to transport the blood. So in more severe cases, more blood vessels are being blocked. That'll deprive the retina of the blood supply in certain areas. And then kind of almost something a little counterintuitive happens. These areas that are being damaged start to secrete growth factors that tell the retina to grow new blood vessels. And you might think that's great, but then what happens is these new blood vessels are growing, but they um, are very fragile and they're growing right along the inner side of the retina and into the fluid like gel that's on the inner part of the eye. And because these are so fragile, they are these new ones, they're much more likely to leak and then start bleeding. And so then you get accompanying scar tissue and that can ultimately cause retinal detachment. So the pulling away of the retina from the tissue below it, kind of like wallpaper peeling away from the wall. And it can't be reattached once that happens. So that can actually lead to permanent vision loss. Um, so diabetic retinopathy is, is, um, is, is a very serious problem. And, and it's some of these um, issues, especially early signs of these microaneurysms that doctors are frequently looking for so they can catch it early and hopefully treat it because um, once it gets to this proliferative and severe and proliferative stages, there's not really much you can do, unfortunately. So we've spent some time talking about the layers of the eyes and some additional structures uh, such as the lens, um, but um, what about the cavity of the eye itself? We can actually split the eye into two separate cavities that are split essentially along the line of the lens. If we look posterior to the lens, that's what we simply refer to as the posterior cavity. Anterior from the lens all the way out to that cornea is where we're going to have the anterior cavity. Besides the difference in size, the probably more important difference between the two of these is what they contain. In the posterior cavity is where we're going to find what's referred to as a vitreous humor while aqueous humor is going to be found in the anterior cavity. Aqueous means water-like, so as you can probably imagine, that's a very um, watery fluid that's going to be in that anterior cavity. Um, it's very similar in consistency to cerebrospinal fluid, and it's actually produced by all of those little ciliary processes, all of those little foldings there on the ciliary body. The vitreous humor, on the other hand, in the posterior cavity um, is, um, very, is a very gelatinous. Um, if you were to open up the eye and take that vitreous humor out of the posterior cavity, it almost has the consistency kind of like an egg yolk, if you will, only it's completely clear. In addition, we can go to that anterior cavity and divide it up even further by looking through the pupil. If we consider the space between the lens and the pupil, there's kind of a little gap down here that kind of goes around the, all of the suspensory ligaments. Um, that is the area that's going to be referred to as the posterior chamber. On the other hand, between the pupil and that cornea, that part of the anterior cavity is referred to as the anterior chamber. So don't mix up the two, uh, the two terms between chamber and cavity. There's, only, there's one posterior cavity and there's an anterior cavity. There's no subdivisions of the posterior cavity, but the anterior cavity has a posterior chamber and an anterior chamber and the distinction between them is um, that the posterior chamber is posterior to the pupil and the anterior chamber is anterior to the pupil.